I'm not too worried about that. I've always said that my films and very good films should take people to a place that they cannot imagine. And our young animator, Dan Mass, who's 20, who's 24 years old when he did this, is by my estimation a kind of genius. And I'm very, very determined to work with him again. You may laugh about this, but I've got 8,000 photographs of Arnold Schwarzenegger that I <coughs> took over a 10-year period between about 1972 and 82. And I read in The New Yorker two weeks ago that someone had taken still photographs of Nijinsky, the great ballet dancer, and animated them and turned them into a film. And right now, I'm thinking as quickly as I can about how to take those 8,000 photos <laughs> with all rights that I acquired and turn it into a two-hour film on Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and I observe that the budget in his films is about 200 million, so maybe Hollywood will give me some big money this summer. <laughs> this right here. How do we know that the channels on Mars were carved by water instead of lava? There are a number of lines of evidence that point, I think, pretty conclusively in that direction. Yes, lava can car carve channels. Yes, water can carve channels. But there tend to be distinctive morphologic differences between the two. Uh, for example, when, water, when, when lava carves a channel, as it's sloshing around, some of the lava will go up on the banks of the channel, and what happens is that it solidifies there, so it actually builds little levees along the edge of the channel. We don't see that. Uh, the most distinctive thing is that many of the channels on Mars have well-developed tributary systems, branching and branching and branching, and that's very hard to explain as, as lava channels. So I, I think we can say with a pretty considerable degree of confidence that, that what we're seeing in the case of the, the valley that, that flows into Gusev Crater is that it is water carved. There are places on Mars where we do see lava channels, but it's, it's possible to distinguish between the two on the base of the morphologic details. Sir. The question is, would there be any desire to use a rover in the polar regions? Um, you know, it's tempting, but I think the polar regions are actually better suited to stationary landers that provide you with vertical mobility. If you looked at those Phoenix images, it was pretty much the same in all directions on the surface. Uh, the polar deposits of Mars are very flat, and you can travel for long distances over the surface and see very much the same thing. The interesting story lies below the surface, and there's a very detailed stratigraphy below the surface that is telling us about climate change on Mars. And so to me, if I were able to do a follow-on mission to the polar deposits, rather than sending a rover to kind of go trundling across the surface and see the same thing over and over again, I would do the same thing that people do on the polar plateau in Antarctica, and I would drill. I think that's where the really interesting science is, is the vertical mobility. The yellow shirt. Uh, concerning drilling, do you have any uh, idea of the possibility of drilling down with a robot, maybe 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Drilling, deep, deep, deep drilling with robotic systems on Mars. Um, I'm actually going to have the chance, as will Robert Zubrin, next week to talk to the Augustine Commission. I'm in the process of writing my testimony for that right now, and one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is some of the science that, that humans could do on Mars. And I believe that deep drilling is, A, one of the most important pieces of science that we might eventually do on Mars because it could get down to depths where liquid water is present today with all that that implies. And B is one of the tasks that I simply cannot imagine doing robotically. Deep drilling requires me hundreds of meters of pipe, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff. You ever been to a drill rig? I mean, these are big, complicated things. And I just have a hard time believing that you could pull that off robotically in any reasonable time scale. 
So uh, I don't think that's a, that's a task that's well suited to robots. I think that's one that's well suited to humans. The white shirt. Have we found quartz? No, we have not found quartz at all on Mars. We have found silica, SiO2, but it's amorphous silica. In particular, it's hydrated amorphous silica. It's opal, sort of like the gemstone, only all ground up. But nowhere have we found quartz. And that's a, not, that's a mineral that we would be able to identify pretty easily. So we haven't found it. Haven't found it. Excuse me? You know, I think at this point, I'd have to say it's unlikely. Mars is basically a basalt planet. Basalt doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a lot of silica uh, doesn't have as high a silica content as some other rocks, and so it doesn't tend to have a lot of quartz in it. Right here. How much of the solar rays degraded since day one? How much of the solar rays degraded since day one? What do you mean by degraded? Well, Power-wise, have you noticed that you've lost power since day one because of the solar rays have degraded abrasion or whatever? Uh, the only loss of performance that we have seen from the solar arrays is from the buildup of dust on the arrays, and that is a purely reversible process if the wind cleans them off. So the arrays have not degraded at all, except insofar as they have gotten dirty and then, you know, sometimes gotten clean again. Blue shirt. Lady. Uh, the, the, in the images, she's asking about some of the bluish tone that you saw in, in some of the images. Uh, the images in the film are a mix. Most of them are what we call approximate true color, which means it's our best attempt to get the color exactly as your eye would see it. And the vast majority of the images in the film are of that sort. There are a few, especially in the closing credits, uh, that are what we call false color images, and there the, uh, color, the contrast uh, has been enhanced, and so things that are slightly bluish look much bluer. But there's really nothing truly blue on Mars. Right there. Yes, sir. Can you speak up a bit, please? Uh, yeah, what has been the f failure and success rate for NASA missions to Mars? The thing that drove it home to me was simply that the two immediately be before ours failed. <laughs> and that kind of shaped our environment. I think, yeah, if you stack it up with the successes now of Phoenix, uh, Spirit, Opportunity, plus the recent orbiters, NASA's success rate at Mars is actually pretty darn good. Uh, but, and, and in fact, I think the human race's success rate is starting to creep up towards 50%. Uh, but it's still, don't take away from that that we've got Mars figured out. It's still a damn hard place to do business. Far less side. Why aren't we mass producing spirit and opportunity? Um, it's a complicated question. It, part of it is that NASA just historically has not been an agency that flies multiple, multiple, multiple copies of something that works well. They tend to want to go on to the next thing. And I, that's sort of driven by the personality of the agency, by the personalities of the people who are within it. Um, Mars is a complicated enough place, it's a diverse enough place that you could throw down 8 or 10 or 12 or 50 of these things and each one would be finding new things. Um, I think the idea has some merit, but that is not what the agency has chosen to do. And it, to do so would go very much against the historical trends within the agency. Sir. The, the question is, how did uh, all the lava get into Gusev Crater in the first place? Um, it's actually very common on many planetary bodies. Mars is one of them, but the new moon is a great example. Okay, on the surface of